Welcome to the FAA's virtual public workshop on the draft environmental assessment for the South Central Florida Metroplex. I'm Michael O'Hara, Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region. Florida is the only state in the country with four major international airports, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Orlando, and Tampa. Palm Beach and St. Pete Clearwater International are also important airports in the national airspace system. In addition, Florida has a significant number of general aviation airports. You get the picture. Florida is one of the busiest states for aviation in the United States. The South Central Florida Metroplex is the FAA's plan to modernize air traffic procedures for 21 airports in the southern half of Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology. While safe, these procedures are less precise and efficient than those based on satellite technology. The satellite-based routes proposed for the Metroplex project will enhance safety and efficiency across the region. Metroplex will benefit passengers by creating more direct routes, decrease congestion at airports and in the air, improve air traffic flows, enhancing safety and efficiency, and reduce complexity and communication for air traffic controllers and pilots, making the system safer. Before we can change procedures, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires us to conduct an environmental assessment to determine the potential impacts of the proposed procedures. One purpose of NEPA is to ensure that proposals, alternatives, and environmental impacts of projects are fully disclosed to the public. That's why we're here today. On May 11th, the FAA posted the Draft Environmental Assessment, or EA, for the Metroplex, and we opened a 60-day public comment period that closes on July 10th. We hope that you will consider submitting comments about the document. On this website, you can click the Comments tab, and it will show you how to submit your comments. It provides email addresses and a physical address where you can send comments after the workshop. Be sure to get your comments in before the July 10th deadline. After the comment period closes, we will review and consider all substantive comments received during the comment period as we develop the environmental determination. We expect to issue the determination by September 30th, 2020. A note about the draft EA. The FAA identified inadvertent errors related to runway designations for Orlando, Tampa, and St. Pete Clearwater International Airports. We updated the document on May 13th, and it's posted at metroplexenvironmental.com. I'd like to cover three procedural items before we start. First, if you're having technical issues, you can text us anytime during the workshop at 949-478-0253 or click the technical support tab on this web page. Second, the workshop will last 90 minutes. We are recording the workshop and it will be posted on this website tomorrow for you to review. You can share the link with friends and neighbors who are unable to participate today. And finally, we have experts available to answer questions about the draft EA, and the proposed air traffic control procedures. FAA air traffic controllers, environmental specialists, and industry representatives will answer your questions after the presentation. As a reminder, the questions asked and answers provided here are not part of the official record for the draft EA. To comment for the official record, click on the Comments tab on this website. That will link you to the FAA's official comment page for this project. Now, Lisa Favors, an environmental specialist for the FAA's Air Traffic Organization, will brief us on the draft environmental assessment. Thank you, Michael. 
I will explain the draft EA for the, the South Central Florida Metroplex. As mentioned earlier, we developed the document in accordance with NEPA, which requires us first to identify the purpose and need for the project. In this case, the purpose and need addresses the current inefficient arrival and departure procedures for airports in South Central Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology and are less precise and efficient than satellite procedures. We need to fix that. The draft EA identifies causes for inefficiency as lack of predictable routes or procedures to transition aircraft between airport runways and high altitude in route airspace. Complex interactions between converging routes and lack of flexibility for air traffic controllers as they transition flights between high altitude and low altitude airspace. By adopting new procedures, which the draft EA calls the proposed action, we expect reduced workload due to fewer controller pilot communications, more efficient operations due to decreased complexity, and fewer flight segments resulting in more predictable traffic flows. A detailed explanation of the purpose and need is included in Chapter 2 of the draft EA. The draft EA analyzes potential environmental impacts from the proposed action and the no action alternative. It is important to note that we analyze many additional procedures, but they not carried forward for detailed study in the draft EA because they did not meet the purpose and need or applicable safety standards. Under no action, procedures in place from June 2017 to May 2018 would remain except for planned modifications that are independent of the Metroplex. Our analysis determined that only the proposed action would meet the purpose and need for the project. The no action alternative would not meet the purpose and need, but it was included in the draft EA as required by Council on Environmental Quality Regulations. The alternatives are described in Chapter 3 of the draft EA. Affected environment describes the human, physical, and natural environmental conditions that the proposed action could affect. The affected environment is described in detail in Chapter 4 of the draft EA. The draft EA considers the effects on 14 environmental resource categories and their subcategories identified in FAA guidance. We evaluated the alternatives under conditions forecasted for 2021, the first year the proposed action could be implemented and under the 2026 forecasted conditions. The evaluation considers the direct indirect and cumulative effects of the proposed action and no action alternatives. The draft EA determined that neither the proposed action nor the no action alternatives are likely to cause significant environmental impacts to any of the environmental resource categories. For more information, you can review chapter five in the draft EA. The rest of my discussion will focus on the noise analysis since you, the public, express most interest in that. However, feel free to ask questions about any category during the Q&A session later in the workshop. First, I will explain how we measure noise. The FAA measures aviation noise using the day-night average sound level, DNL, metric. DNL represents noise as it occurs over a 24 hour period with nighttime noise weighted more heavily than daytime noise. DNL is the standard noise metric used for studies of aviation noise exposure in communities. 
To account for differences in how people respond to noise, we use the A-weighted scale, DBA. This scale closely approximates the volume of sound as perceived by the human ear. The FAA considers aircraft noise exposure of 65 DNL in residential areas and noise increases of DNL 1.5 dB or more for noise sensitive areas exposed to noise at or above the DNL 65 dB noise exposure level to be significant. The noise analysis demonstrates that the proposed action would not result in significant noise increases. More information about how the FAA measures noise is in Appendix E of the draft EA, and a detailed noise analysis can be found in Appendix I. Before I end, the following video will show you how to look up noise information for your address. You may search more than 122,000 grid points of noise data in the study area presented in decibels, abbreviated as DB. The grid points are U.S. Census population points located at one half nautical mile intervals across the entire study area. The map opens to the study area. In the search bar, start typing your address and similar addresses will pop up. Click on the correct address and you will see a light blue map pin. The map shows the model grid points in blue. Click on each point to see a pop-up with noise analysis results. The map shows data including DNL calculated for the alternatives and the change in noise when the proposed action is compared to the no action alternative. Now our air traffic control expert will brief you on some of the more significant procedures the Metroplex proposes for your area. I'm an air traffic controller who works for the FAA's Miami Air Traffic Control Tower and Approach Control. In this section of the website, we will walk you through the flight procedures, poster boards for Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood International Airport, and Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. Each of these boards shows a sampling of existing flight tracks and the proposed new flight procedures for jet aircraft. Any single board will show either arrival or departure tracks and procedures. They are all overlaid on the street map of the area surrounding the airports. Each flight procedure board is oriented with north facing up. The name of the airport and the names of the flight procedures are in the box on the upper right corner. This box also shows the type of operation, either arrival or departure, and the direction of flight which we call flow, either north, south, east, or west. Flow is related to the layout of the airport's runways and it indicates which direction the aircraft is facing when it lands or takes off from the airport's runway. A few acronyms are used in the boards. A standard instrument departure, or SID, is a departure. A standard terminal arrival, or STAR, is an arrival. Air navigation, or RNAV, is the term for modern satellite-based navigation technology used in the proposed procedures. The spelling of each arrival or departure procedure is limited, limited to five letters. For example, the spelling of the SNAPR departure is pronounced snapper. The starts on the board are locations of waypoints, which are fixed navigational points in space that the aircraft fly to. Just as with the spelling of procedures, waypoints are spelled with five letters. For example, the CLPSO waypoint will be pronounced Calypso. The proposed flight procedures are color purple for departures and orange for arrivals. This color path shows the intended flight path in the future for most flight using the new procedures. Surrounding the path are dispersed path areas in either pink for departures or yellow for arrivals. 
These areas show the possible locations where aircraft may fly in the future and account for the possibility of different routing to avoid hazardous weather, for operational need, or for safety. The existing flight tracks are shown on the legend by color, starting from the lowest altitudes in pink, then blue, teal, and finally the highest altitudes are in green. The flight tracks shown are a just sample of jet aircraft flights, which occur from March to April 2018 during the daytime, which does not include nighttime hours between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. The bullet points on the right side provide additional details about the procedures. Next, we'll take a look at a few arrival and departure boards for these airports. This flight procedure board for jet aircraft at Colorado Hollywood International Airport is for east flow departures. This is the most common direction of air traffic flow at Colorado International. There are nine proposed departure procedures that will be used when the airport is in an east flow which means airplanes are taking off towards the east over water and arriving over the land from the west and east. This is the most common direction of air traffic flow at Fort Lauderdale International Airport. In an east flow, there are eight departures to the west, east and north, called Reggae, Snapper, Felix, Arps, Beke, Twister, Bongos, and glades. For airplanes with destinations to the south, there's only one departure set called Mojito. Airplanes taken off and fly east, then turn to the southeast on the reggae or snapper procedure, turn to the northeast on the Felix departure, or to the north on the Arps, Beke, Bongos, Twister, and Glades departure. Aircraft with destination to the west use the bungos the procedure. This board also shows the jet departure procedures for Miami International Airport, which turn north and fly near the Fort Lauderdale area. Aircraft from Miami using the twister and arps procedures will initially depart navigating along the procedure and then will be given a heading to follow, called a vector, by the air traffic controller. These are shown in a lighter shade of purple and labeled with small arrows. After departure, an air traffic controller can give a pilot a heading to follow, call a vector that will guide them out of the Fort Lauderdale area. This flight procedure board is for jet aircraft departures of Fort Lauderdale International Airport on a west flow. There are nine proposed departure procedures that will be used when the airport is on a west flow, which means airplanes are taken off towards the west over land and arriving over the ocean from the east heading west. This is the less common direction flow of traffic at Fort Lauderdale International Airport. There are seven departures used for west, east, and north destination called Reggae, Snapper, Felix, Arps, Twister, Beke, and Bongos. For airplanes with destinations to the south, there are two departure procedures called Mojito and Glade departures. Airplanes flying to the east make a turn to the north and east using the reggae, snapper, Felix departure procedures. Aircraft with destinations to the north use the ARPS, Beke, or Twister departure procedures. The ARPS procedures are also used by Miami International Airport, which are shown on the light purple lines. West flow departures from Miami join the ARPS departure procedure near Boca Raton. The Twister is also used by Miami. Aircraft from Miami merge onto the Twister departure near the South Florida Wildlife Management Area. This flight procedure board is for jet aircraft arrivals at Fort Lauderdale International Airport on an east flow. There are four proposed arrivals that will be used when the airport is on an east flow. There are two runways oriented east to west. Aircraft coming from the west North and Northwest typically land on the North Runway, which is runway 10 left. These arrivals would use the CUDA, Tiki, and OLAS procedures. Aircraft coming from the South, Southeast, and East land on the South Runway, which is runway 10 right, and will use the Bahia arrival. However, air traffic controllers may assign alternate runways for operational needs. 
This flight procedure board is for jet aircraft arrivals at Fort Lauderdale International Airport on a west flow. There are four proposed arrival procedures that will be used when the airport is on a west flow. Aircraft coming from the west, north, and northwest typically land on the north runway, which is runway 2A right. These arrivals will use the CUDA, Tiki, and Bahia arrivals. Aircraft coming from the south, southeast, and east land on the south runway, which is runway 2A left, and will use the OLAS arrival. This flight procedure board for Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport shows the departure and arrival procedures for east flow, which as previously noted, is the most common direction of air traffic at Fort Lauderdale. This board shows all the arrival and departure procedures used when the airport is on an east flow. There are nine proposed departure procedures shown in purple and four proposed arrival procedures shown in orange that will be used in an east flow which is the aircraft taking off to the east over the ocean and arriving over the land. There are two departure procedures shown in light purple that are also used by Miami International Airport for destinations to the north and west, which are the ARPS and the Twister procedures. This flight procedure board for Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport shows the departure and arrival procedures for west flow, which is the less common direction of air traffic at this airport. This board shows all the arrival and departure procedures used when the airport is on a west flow. There are nine proposed departure procedures shown in purple and four proposed arrival procedures shown in orange that will be used in west flow, which is aircraft taking off to the west over the land and arriving over the ocean. There are two departure procedures shown in light purple that are also used by Miami International Airport for destinations to the north and west the ARPS and the Twister procedures. All right, good evening. Welcome to the workshop on the South Central Florida Metroplex. This is our live Q&A session and I'm Michael O'Hara, the Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region. I'm joined by several technical experts with us tonight, including Rick and Luis, air traffic controllers from the Miami Air Traffic Control Tower and Radar Approach Control. Lisa Favors, FAA Environmental Specialist, uh, several others from the FAA, as well as some airport and airline industry representatives. Uh, Luis and Eddie are also available to help with any needed Spanish translation. And as a reminder, we're holding this workshop to answer your questions about the South Central Florida Metroplex. We're unable to answer questions about other topics in this specific workshop. You can submit your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom, or you can use the link in Facebook or YouTube, or you can text us a question at 949-478-0253. Again, that number, if you wanna text us a question is 949-478-0253. If you need technical assistance during the workshop, please click on the technical support tab on our website. And I'll turn it over to Luis for just a moment. Pueden someter sus preguntas en español a través de la aplicación Zoom y a redes sociales como Facebook y YouTube o a través de texto al número 9. Un momento, por favor. Al número 949-478-0253. Una vez más, 949-478-0253. Luis, thank you. All right, so thanks again for everybody for joining us this evening. We have our first question and we'll move right into that. What is the South Central Florida Metroplex? Okay, so the South Central Florida Metroplex is a comprehensive proposal from the Federal Aviation Administration to improve the flow of air traffic into and out of 21 airports in Florida by making the airspace safer and more efficient. This project that we'll discuss this evening proposes to add new more efficient satellite-based procedures and several conventional procedures based on radar and other ground-based nav aids. The initiative focuses on four major international airports where operations have a direct effect throughout the national airspace system. And that includes the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, as well as Miami International, Orlando International, Tampa International, St. Pete Clearwater, Palm Beach, and 15 smaller 
reliever and satellite airports. That's a quick overview. All right, let's move into another question. Will the new procedures increase the noise generated from aircraft? Lisa, let me ask for your help with that one, please. Sure, Michael. Um, the FAA's environmental analysis for the project determined model noise levels at more than 117,000 points across the study area. And it showed that the proposed procedures would not result in any significant or reportable noise increases under FAA criteria. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Okay, so here's a question. I've heard that arrivals to the north runway are lower over those communities than the approaches to the south runway. Why is that and will this project help us? Hey, Michael, this is Rick. Um, if we can pull up the Fort Lauderdale East uh, zoomed in arrival board, hopefully it'll provide a visual reference to why this occurs. Um, but I'll start off by, by saying that the Metroplex project uh, doesn't include any changes to existing techniques presently used by uh, controllers for Fort Lauderdale arrivals that are coming from the north uh, on an east operation. Um, I think when it comes to, to this concern, there are steps being taken at the local level uh, to, address, to address this issue. Um, so we are required to separate airplanes by three miles or 1000 feet until both aircraft are lined up on the finals. And then thereafter we can uh, reduce the separation to a mile and a half. Um, thus, when uh, there is conflicting traffic on the south runway from the west, the air traffic controller will generally descend uh, the aircraft on that base turn from the north downwind underneath that uh, south runway arrival in order to provide uh, stable approaches to uh, both aircraft. And uh, yeah, usually that, uh, that descent goes down to 2,000 feet from the north. Now, uh, we've been given guidance by our facilities leadership to be mindful of those communities out there to the west, northwest. Uh, that's uh, the location of Weston and Southwest ranches. Uh, when there is not an aircraft approaching from the west, from the south runway, we try to keep the aircraft at or above 3,000 feet for the approach. Uh, overall, we generally do not try to uh, descend under 3,000 feet unless there is conflicting traffic from the south runway. Okay, Rick, uh, Jim, uh, before you, uh, I'll come right back to you, Jim, I promise. But there's, a, there's, a, there's another question. I just wanna make sure we cover maybe both at the same time. Uh, so it, it says the FAA has mentioned that the altitude of arriving aircraft would mirror what we're experiencing today and that OPD would not necessarily play a major role in arrivals at Fort Lauderdale. It says ATC indicated arrivals on the north runway would be cleared down to 1500 to allow separation of aircraft arriving on the south runway. How is that consistent with what was discussed with Weston in December 2019 and the FAA's commitment of controllers to keep aircraft at altitudes no less than 3,000 over Weston? Uh, will FAA keep this commitment to the community? So I think those are, those are the same questions. I just want to make sure we cover both while we're on the topic. So back to you, Jim. All right, Michael. And, well, one of the things that, that Rick mentioned was that stabilized approach. So what we're talking about in those air traffic procedures and intercepting that uh, ILS, it's all about aircraft safety. And I think we've got Gary McMullen on here, one of the uh, Southwest pilots. He could probably talk to us about, uh, you know, how critical that is in that particular phase of flight. Yeah, for each, of, each arrival that we fly as pilots, a stabilized approach is critical for safety. And all that means is prior to reaching a thousand feet above the ground, we want to be fully stable with the landing gear down, flaps extended, all of our checklists completed so that we can concentrate on the remaining part of the approach. So the stable approach criteria that we use is very, very important to be able to maintain the safety that we have today. It sounds like you're pretty busy when you're getting to that point in the flight. When uh, we're within a few minutes of, of landing, that's one of the busiest phases, the second busiest phases of the flight. Getting the airplane configured, and what I mean by configured is we lower the flaps, extend the landing gear, get the airplane slowed down to the proper approach speed, 
and then run our last checklist. Uh, that means that we're a thousand feet above the ground, fully stable when we continue to the landing from that. It is busy. All right, Gary and Jim, uh, Rick, thank you. So the chart that we're sharing there shows the procedures coming in and making turns. Rick, I don't wanna try to requote exactly what you said, but we expect them to make those turns similar to how they make those today. And I think I heard you say the facility continues to be mindful of keeping the aircraft as high as they can be when when there's a veil of, when there's no traffic on the south runway, which is consistent with what we shared in that December meeting. Is that? That's, that's accurate. Uh, where those airplanes are turning base today, it's, it's gonna look like that in the future. That's based on uh, volume and, and sequencing. So yeah, it should, it should be very, very similar to what it looks like today. Okay. All right, I appreciate it. I know we, we combined a couple there, but I, I thought we, they were almost the same question. So, all right, let's move to another one. I live near Pompano, uh, Boca Raton, and already have enough airplane noise from turning too soon off of Fort Lauderdale and flying out of the area labeled ARPS. Uh, now you're going to have planes off of Miami too. Why are we adding planes to this area? I thought this was supposed to reduce noise. I, I don't agree with more flights. So Michael, I'll tackle that one. So we did not merge the streams. What we actually did is we provided four different routes instead of the current two routes for each airport. In turn, what we are allowing is for a more efficient uh, flight path all the way from departure point to their destination. And, and it will reduce the amount of level offs. And, and the other thing that I wanted to address, um, the concern with the Miami departures, we predict all this aircraft uh, departing Miami Airport using the ARPS to be very close to 10,000 feet, if not higher, when they're in the area of Pompano and Boca Raton. All right, Luis, so that, that shows the east flow. All right, I just wanna leave that up for a moment. If I can add on to that, Michael, as well, um, it's true that there are going to be Miami departures that are going to be going out the ARPS area, but there's also going to be a reduction of aircraft from Fort Lauderdale that will be flying on the ARPS. They're actually going to be now going to the vacay because that's an additional route that was added to, uh, for Fort Lauderdale. Okay, thanks, Rick. And we're not, we're not predicting that this project, this project will not increase the number of uh, flights out of Miami or Fort Lauderdale. That's not what this is about. So the, the flights coming out of Miami should be a similar volume to what they are today. Is that, I mean, we fork, uh, sometimes the FAA uses a forecast, the volume could grow over time, but that's not what this project is doing. Um, okay. All right, so we covered the next question already. Let's go to this, uh, a, a new question. Uh, Broward County Aviation Department received uh, 47,157 noise complaints from Southwest Fort Lauderdale and Southeast Plantation last year. And this is uh, five times the number of complaints received from the rest of Broward County combined. You can solve this noise problem by using C's instead of dreads which will put the departures over industrial areas that departing planes flew over for 30 years instead of residential areas where they fly now and will continue to fly with your plan. Why aren't you considering C's for north runway departures instead of dreads? All right, so let's, let's take a look at that question. Rick, do you wanna help with that? Um, sure. So when we designed these procedures, um, we stuck to e existing flight tracks, which uh, today, if they're going on procedures with destinations to the north and northeast, they depart Fort Lauderdale Airport on a 290 heading and all the other departures uh, depart on a 275 heading. Um, now, we 
we usually have to use fit or we have to use 15 degrees of divergence to separate those airplanes off the airport. We are taking advantage of satellite based technology. We are able to reduce the divergence by 10 degrees. I think here it's actually 11 degrees. It's called uh, ELSO, which is equivalent lateral spacing operations. So with that said, we were able to str uh, strategically put dreads in an area that pretty much does fly over uh, more industrial areas. This stays south of the 595 highway. In addition to that, when the aircraft departs off Fort Lauderdale, they'll actually be on a westbound heading prior to turning to dreads. So this should ensure that the aircraft will remain uh, uh, south of 595 where there's uh, more dense populated um, areas. Now, when it goes to why not all aircraft go to seas, this, this would drastically affect the uh, throughput of the airport, which could back the airport up and, and cause delays. Fort Lauderdale has been one of the fastest growing airports um, in the country and uh, limiting the airport's throughput to one path uh, would, cause, would cause those delays. All right, Rick, thanks. Does anybody else have any, anything to add from the panel on that? You know, um, Michael, Jim here, and if I could get Gary to help out too, one of the, one of the great things about that ELSO and then the way that this procedure is coded it's a really good example of how we use PBN or performance-based navigation procedures. So, I, sure, I can. I can go ahead, that. Gary. Sure. The uh, the aircraft uses today with flying PBN procedures what's called a flight management cube computer on board the aircraft. And on takeoff, what we do is we follow this path, uh, following a heading, and it intercepts a course. The course is a very defined path along the ground that that we will uh, fly. The pilot is hand flying the airplane until it gets a little bit higher in altitude and they may or may not turn the autopilot on to, to, to continue to fly the aircraft. But with today's aircraft, the automation on board, we use it to fly the airplane and it helps us to maintain these paths that are designed in these procedures. All right, Gary, thanks. And, and Jim, Rick, I appreciate it. So the graphic that's up now is, is a Google Earth overlay. And most of the charts that we show in the workshops are available on floridametroplexworkshops.com. You may have seen that when you entered into the workshop, if you came in on that website tonight under project boards, uh, you can click through those. They're narrated on that website. They're available. You can zoom in. This actual one is a Google Earth overlay that's part of the draft environmental assessment website. That's at an, uh, metroplexenvironmental.com. You go to the Florida site and you, you can see the documents available. And right at the bottom of that page is a link for uh, the Google Earth files if you want that level of detail. We, we just brought that up because that was a pretty precise question. So let's, let's move on to the next question. At, at Fort Lauderdale, the Olaz Star dispersed path area is dangerously and poorly planned. Uh, with a westbound flow landing west on runway 28 left, the dispersed path area for forces a, a dangerously tight 180 degree turn to the left in order to line up on the localizer for 28 left. The northern end of the dispersed path area is less than one mile south of the localizer center line and requires a a dangerously tight turn to intercept it. This first path area needs to be moved southwards to the same location south of Pembroke Road, as is shown in the east flow close view for entrance from the east into the Bahia Star. This one's a long one, I'm just reading it as is. Uh, the 180 degree turns from this dispersed path area in this east flow close view is much more sensible and less dangerous. Why? Why? Because it's further south. It also has a larger dispersed area, so the burdens on people on the ground are more dispersed. Um, so that, I'm looking kind of through that for the question. Maybe we can comment on that, uh, you know, part of the design criteria that went into that, Rick, if you could help with that. Um, sure. 
the board that we should uh, have up is the West Arrival Board. I, b I believe the question was addressed about a, uh, the OLAS. If there's a zoomed in version of the OLAS procedure for a West Arrival. So for the most part, this um, star, uh, it's out in the ocean. It, uh, it's uh, for aircraft that are coming from destinations south and to the southeast. And uh, I believe the last altitude that we have that uh, uh, the commenter was, was uh, referring to stops at 5,000 feet and actually is connected to an approach on the localizer. Um, it's not uh, that drastic of a turn. It's not 180 degrees. Um, and I'm not, it is about, I think a mile and a half, maybe two miles south of the localizer. I'm not sure if it's a, a dangerous turn. Maybe Gary can, can speak on that, but it is connected to an approach and, and it did meet the criteria requirement for when we designed it. It, it does, and I, and I can help. There are two methods that we use as pilots to be able to join the 28 left localizer. That's the first one that this path down the, from the OLAS to Carnival would join. The, the piece that can't be seen is there's a, also a transition or a line that goes to the approach to 28 left. When we fly these, we're, when we're cleared from Carnival on the approach, we use the flight management computer again, and it has a thing called turn anticipation. So when we turn, we have to join the final at 30 degrees. The airplane is smart enough to know that we're not gonna go to the end of that. It's a flyby waypoint. The airplane will turn approximately a mile prior to that and join that course at a 30 degree intercept to the final approach course to runway 28 left. It does it very smoothly, very precisely, and it's very accurate for us to do it that way. The second method that we do that with, with quite ease is to be able to use what's called a heading mode in the airplane. Air traffic, and Rick, you can join here in just a moment, but what they do is they vector us to the final. So we switch modes with our autopilot and our flight director, and they intercept us on that final again uh, at a 30 degree intercept, and we do that method also. So there's two ways of doing it. Both of them are easy, and, and that's a well-designed procedure. And uh, yes, Gary, uh, we probably would vector off the procedure. Um, at, at that point, where the star ends, uh, we would have determined our sequence, and there's going to be times where we're probably going to want to uh, send the airplane more direct towards the airport to beat competing traffic, let's say, coming from the northeast. And there's other times where we might actually have to turn farther east just to sequence uh, the aircraft to the airport. Okay, good explanation. Uh, thanks, Rick and Gary. Hopefully we covered what the, what the questioner was looking for on that. All right, let me keep us moving to the next question. Currently all Broward County libraries are closed until further notice. If these libraries don't open until after the comment period, how does someone without internet access get to see a hard copy of the environmental assessment documents? Jim, do you wanna help with that? Certainly, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll weigh in, and I know that it's going to flow to uh, Lisa at some point here. When we sent out the notice of, avail of availability, we provided guidance in there, and that was published in the local newspapers, of course, that uh, we could be contacted. There was contact information that will, in fact, flow to Lisa, the, uh, the, uh, the anonymous uh, address that was provided in the NOA. If someone here knows of somebody who is in that situation, then I'd encourage you to provide them with the contact information that's on the Florida Metroplex website, um, dot com. Uh, I'm sorry, the Florida Metroplex workshops dot com uh, website, uh, you know, or submit the request for them and we will contact them and see what we can do to help them out. Is that, uh, that cover, Lisa? Um, that is true, uh, Jim, I, and I think we, heard that um, some air, um, some libraries in Broward County are now opening and we we have gotten information that the um, main branch um, has provided some hard copies at some of those uh, libraries as well as all of the libraries listed on our website 
um, has the document on flash drives and are able to pull that up on a computer if you would like to look at it. But specifically hard copies um, are available at some of the branches um, down there in Broward County. And you are welcome to, uh, if, if you're not able to put your hands on one if and, and you contact us, but a quick contact of the Broward County Library System, uh, I think www.BrowardCounty.org and search for library. You can find some a contact there that could probably put you in touch with uh, where you could locate a hard copy locally. All right, and, and I did check a little bit earlier. We know that the libraries are open down in, in the Miami Beach area. You know, when I checked a little bit earlier, I didn't see that the Broward libraries were open. So that could okay. be could be a little bit of a concern. So we know definitely down in uh, Miami that that librarian is uh, actively engaged with us. And I think that the Broward libraries at this point are walk up or drive up drive up service. So I, I can understand and I'd encourage the person who submitted the question. If you know of somebody in that situation, then please, uh, you know, help them. Contact us. And we'll see what yes. we can do. Yes. Thank and you for Jim, that correction. Jim, I may be repeating you, you. I thought you referred to the Florida Metroplex workshops, but the metroplexenvironmental.com website may be what you said. That's, that's where you can go and click on uh, public input and you'll see the list of libraries there. And right above the list of libraries is where you can find the contact info if you need to reach us, if you're having difficulty. So that's metroplexenvironmental.com and go through to the Florida Metroplex, click on public input. Right. That, that's correct, Michael. Um, and if somebody's not, if somebody's not able, I mean, I'm saying go click there, but if you need to submit information, I think we said in some other workshops, if you're aware of someone who needs contact info, you can send us a, a, a comment even through, through the, the, the 949-478-0253 and we could try to, to get in touch with someone if we need to do that. If you're aware of if that's passed along on behalf of someone else. All right, how are these departures any different from existing RNAV SIDS? Uh, my screen's moving um, around, Luis, could you help with that? Yeah, this uh, um, are gonna be RNAV of the ground SIDS, the SIDS to the east or to extend out to stay over in those areas longer before turning to the north or the south. To the west, the waypoints are further to the west to have traffic to remain over industry and south of 595, further west before they turn to the north. Um, another advantage of this RNAV SIDS is that the rules have changed since the, the ones that we had before that were done more than 10 years ago. Now we're going to be able to use ELSA, like we mentioned before. Uh, the divergent degree separation has changed, and we can go all the way down 10 degrees which allows us to stay over those uh, industrial areas a little longer than we do right now. The older ones that we had, they didn't reflect the way traffic is worked nowadays. And then when we designed these new procedures, we try to stay as close to the center of where most of the departures are work nowadays. Thanks, Luis. All right, so quick message to our viewers. We're seeing a lot of folks on Zoom, social media. Keep those questions coming. You can text us questions at 949-478-0253 or use the Zoom Q&A button. You can also submit a question. There's a form you can access on social media. We'll continue to take new questions till 730 and we'll continue to answer questions we've received up until that point. So I'm gonna keep us moving to the next question. What equipment is required to fly the SIDS and STARS? I have a WASP GPS, but cannot fly RNAV or PBN procedures. Uh, it's a right. light. I know I'm going to be fighting, fighting Gary a, for this one. Yeah, so, he's a light airplane pilot just to finish right. that. So Jim, Gary, go ahead. Right. It, you need an IFR certified um, flight management system that's capable of recalling a procedure from a database. Um, the specifics of the requirements for uh, these types of procedures, which require um, a, a navigation specification of uh, RNAV-1, those can be found in advisory circular 9100 alpha and that will detail that information. But I know that, that he could be challenged. And Gary, uh, can you tell us about the, uh, 
you know, what you might find in that uh, system in a um, light aircraft? I can. It is awfully, it's an awful lot of fun to fly light airplanes, and I am familiar with a WASH GPS. And it depends on what equipment this gentleman or has in his aircraft or she has in, his, in their aircraft. But they are allowed to fly uh, GPS approaches uh, with, with this equipment. But these procedures aren't uh, designed for uh, light aircraft to be able to fly. It's generally turbojet aircraft that can fly these procedures. So it takes a, just a little bit more equipment in the airplane to fly these new procedures. So, so then uh, both of you can confirm this, but if they don't have the correct equipment for uh, those procedures, then we, we still have the non-conventional procedures that can be used just like they are today. That's correct. All right. All right, thank you both. Uh, this one, this one looks more like a comment. The big issue in South Florida that throws a wrench is weather when we have to go around thunderstorms. So uh, certainly that's a good point. Um, I think we've all seen weather can, can uh, cause a little bit of havoc in Florida. Uh, any comments about maybe how Metroplex would be any different or the same in terms of how that's handled today? Yeah, Michael, that, that is a good point. Uh, the thunderstorms uh, down here definitely present challenges to air traffic control. Now, uh, when we do have these thunderstorms and th they're affecting you know, the, the path of the procedure, we're gonna have to vector the airplane um, off the procedure and then hopefully we'll get them back on once we can deviate around uh, the weather. But uh, yeah, we'll have to discontinue the, pr uh, the procedure just momentarily until we're, we're able to get that aircraft back on. Okay. So just, just the impacted procedure, right, Rick? I mean, it's not like all of them turn off. So if you have weather impacting a procedure, then aircraft on that procedure would be impacted. Um, that's correct. For, for the most part, that's correct. Uh, I do see a scenario where possibly where we have to vector um, that aircraft off the procedure, it might impact another procedure. So we might also have to uh, discontinue right. the use of the other procedure. But yes, for the most part, um, just for the procedure that's impacted by the weather. Michael, if I may add, um, we currently have RNAP procedures and, and when there's weather, we have uh, systems in place uh, such as severe weather avoidance programs, there's a coordination with adjacent facilities. So there's gonna be plans established for whenever there's weather, if it's in the north side of the airspace, we can take them to the south side of the airspace. Mm -hmm. East, we'll take them to the west. That's all going to be addressed the way it is today. Obviously, if there's a, uh, a cell of weather precipitation to the east of the airport, we won't be able to use the departure of the ground. We probably have to give them a different vector and join them in the procedure later on. But that's all addressed in, in, in letters of agreements with other facilities, um, with the center, with the towers of the satellite airports, and, and, and it's all addressed via letters of agreement and radar vectors. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Luis. All right, we have another question. How, how will an airplane's navigational database uh, be affected by this project? Gary, it looks like you're ready for that. <laughs> well, I, can, I can help you with that one. The database in our airplanes uh, goes through a cycle every 28 days. It is just like a database in a computer and the navigation suppliers that we use, it can be Lido, it can be Jepson, it can be uh, three or four additional vendors that anybody can go to. And they supply that data to us that, that is formatted for our aircraft. So all these procedures are in a database in our airplane and we recall those through uh, in the system called the flight management computer. So it's, that's where they come from. It's a database built into the, the computer. Okay, thanks Gary. So we have a question. Are there any draft SID and star plates yet? Jim, do you wanna take that? Happy to take one. The short answer is no. Um, that's, that's a little further on in the process. We're in the, actually in the evaluation phase of this project at, at the moment. We cannot submit the final procedures for processing for publication until we go into that implementation phase. And that happens 
after we've completed the environmental process and then we have a final record of decision, the final environmental decision on the project. So that's uh, likely won't happen until uh, in the early fall. I think we're tar targeting that September timeframe to um, complete that process. So in right. time after that, and then it, it will be several months after that before we have draft plates too. So, and uh, realistically, I wouldn't expect to see anything until after the new year sometime. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. We have another, another question. In previous workshops, the environmental group stated that Existing radar data is used to determine if the proposed Metroplex procedures affect the same general noise footprint. I do not believe the current radar tracks fall within any established EAs or Part 150 studies. This is important because the current radar track of aircraft over plantation have, have never been studied for noise impact. Putting a new route over tracks that were never studied and then stating the new route has no impact because there would be no change to the noise. Uh, please advise. Um, see, I'm looking for Lisa. We may have we may have lost her. Um, I don't, maybe we can table that question for just a moment, unless anybody has any any immediate thoughts. I think that's one that we would probably look to Lisa for. So we'll hold that. I promise I'm not gonna table it very far. At least they'll be back with us, I'm sure, momentarily. Now let's go to an air traffic question and then we'll come back to that one. How are approaches affected between new stars and approaches? Um, so Michael, all I can say is that all the new approaches and all the new procedures were reviewed to ensure that safety is not compromised and it's a seamless integration. Also, in some cases, the current airspace is going to be modified to accommodate some of the new stars and the OPD. All right. See, so bear with me a sec. Okay. <laughs> Trying to keep keep up with the questions. Luis, are we good with that one? I think so. Yes. And Lisa, you're back. <laughs> I actually texted you a question because I skipped one. So I don't know if you have access to that. Um, but we went okay, through it. Okay, would you I, read it again for me, yeah, please? We, it's nice and long, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. In, in previous workshops, the environmental group stated that existing radar data is used to determine if the proposed Metroplex procedures affect the same general noise footprint. I do not believe the current radar tracks fall within any established EAs or Part 150 studies. This is important because the current radar track of aircraft over plantation have never been studied for noise impact putting a new route over tracks that were never studied and then stating that the new route has no impact because there would be no change to the noise. Uh, please advise. Does that make sense the way I read that? Um, it does, I, I'll try to answer it. Um, any change to a published instrument flight procedure undergoes environmental reviews in accordance with the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, for this EA, the baseline noise data was, um, that was used, it was from June 2001, I'm sorry, June 1st, 2017 to May 30th, 2018, I believe. And, um, you know, aircraft may be flying in other areas than those um, with published procedures when they are vectoring for things such as weather or other emergencies or, you know, sequenced landing, or, you know, um, if, if they're flying under visual flight rules. So, you know, those are kind of out of our control. Um, so I don't know if that particularly answers the question, but. Um, so, so let me see if I, if I have it right. And, and maybe we can determine if, if we explained it. So, 
Okay. We look at a proposed action. This is a proposed set of changes with this procedure. And what, what we study is the difference between what they're doing. When I say today, basically you were you gave a year, a year's worth of data between mid 2017 mm -hmm. and mid 2018. So right. if we didn't do this procedure, we would stay keep doing what we're doing. And if we make Correct. the changes, there there could be a difference. Uh, and that's what's studied. And that's what's studied, the difference in what what is going on right now and what will happen if these procedures are implemented. And that's the only thing that's studied in this uh, in this document. Jim, did you have something to add? My, yes, Michael. It sounds like maybe the uh, submitter is a, a little confused about the purpose of the environmental review for the instrument flight procedures and the purpose of a part 150. So the, the part 150 is an airport noise study. And I know Winston can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think those are can be undertaken every five years and they're, they're used to establish the noise baseline in the immediate vicinity of the airport. Did you wanna um, say anything about that, Winston? I know you're correct, uh, Jim. It's every five years that the, the airport embarks on a part 150 noise compatibility study as per federal guidelines. Right, but they, they are for different purposes. Um, and of course, we know that this is an FAA project. We are doing an environmental assessment on it. It's not related to the uh, Part 150 at the airport. That's correct. All right. Thanks, everyone, for the tag team on that. OK. Regarding east departure operations, I live in the high-rise buildings north of Port Everglades. It appears that departures veer to the left or north immediately after takeoff and not following Felix. Um, all right, so we may pull up those east departures. Uh, Rick, were you going to take that? Sure, I, I, I can uh, take that question. Um, they're not following the Felix departure today because uh, the Felix departure hasn't been implemented yet. Um, today, they depart on a 080 heading, which I believe is what this individual is talking about. Now, the equivalent procedure to the Felix today is called the Zappa. And sometimes those aircraft do depart on a 080 heading. So now with the implementation of the Felix, uh, that should actually take some of those aircraft off that uh, more northeast heading and uh, go more on the uh, east heading. So it should alleviate uh, those turns a bit. All right, great. So they're not doing it today because they're not published. The project hasn't been finalized. Um, all right, so I have, a, I have a question here. It looks like if I send one comment and then decide I have an additional comment to make, can I send in two or am I limited to just one comment? Um, no, I, please keep sending us comments. That's why we're here. We wanna tell you about these proposed procedures. We wanna answer your questions and make sure you have an ability to comment. It's probably a good place for me to remind folks that the conversation or the chat, the questions that are asked and the answers that we're providing are not part of the official record. So we're here to talk about the project and hopefully answer your questions. If you have a comment that you wanna make on the project for the official record, you can go to floridametroplexenvironmental.com. No, floridametroplexworkshops.com. Click on Fort Lauderdale and there'll be a comments tab there. You can submit that right on the website or you can, you'll find an email address or mail address. So again, floridametroplexworkshops.com. All right, we'll keep, keep moving. How are you factoring climb performance and descent rates? Are you factoring time and other, other dimensions? Uh, I guess is it kind of four dimensional maybe a way of putting that? Uh, anyone in, Industry want to talk about that or? Sure, I can, I can help with that. And I bet you Caesar can too. Uh, the, the climb performance is based on several pieces of, of information. It's the weight of the aircraft and the temperature of the day. Those two items uh, generate a power setting and a takeoff speed that we use that, that we fly for each departure. And it is solely based on weight and temperature. The, the, the Descent rates are quite a bit different. 
The, the new airplanes that we fly, again, the flight management computer gives us really uh, a good descent at idle. That's what it's geared to do or designed to do, is show us how we can descend the airplane at idle thrust. We, we are backing that up mentally by looking at time, altitude, distances, and doing some mental calculations. But the, the performance computers are so accurate and so uh, reliable, we don't have to do that much anymore. So the climb performance, all of that's based on weight and temperature. The descent rates, the, the computer's trying to give us an, an ability to descend the airplane at idle, and we're trying to follow that. Caesar, did you have anything to add? Oh, good answer. There's uh, good. nothing. <laughs> good. good job, Gary. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm just looking to see if anybody else has anything on that one. Let me let me move us to to the next one. It says um, you must be aware of the noise issue that's been caused by the 2014 opening of the South Runway. Uh, it, it has resulted in horrendous noise and sleepless nights for many residents in Southwest Fort Lauderdale and Plantation. During the Metroplex workshop last April at the Signature Grand, many comments were submitted asking that the waypoints for westbound departures be moved further west so that those waypoints would head over industrial areas and not residential. A slight change in waypoints like this would vastly benefit everyone in this area, not to mention the safety factor. Does anybody want to uh, comment on that particular area or how we addressed comments from the, the workshops last year? Michael, so I can assure you that all comments uh, from those workshops, they were looked at and they were addressed as much as possible in the design process. So as far as that community, uh, the, the good news for could know for them with this procedures aren't up off the ground, it's gonna eliminate a lot of the early turns that happen based on the timing that the controllers now they issue a vector. All right, Luis. Um, I don't know if that's one, would, you, would the graphics help any on that or do we, um, I'm not sure. If, if there's nothing to add, we can move to the next one. Okay, so here's a question. It appears that there is still no provision on east arrivals to mitigate noise in the west and southwest ranches area. Um, current arrivals are usually required to level off at low altitude around 2,000 to 3,000 feet prior to intercepting the glide slope. The use of a continuous descent arrival would increase aircraft altitude lower the power required and reduce uh, noise during the transition to the ILS approaches to 10 left and right. Maybe we can pull that East Flow arrival board up again. And we touched on this earlier, but maybe we can talk about that West and Southwest ranches area. That's correct, Michael. I was explaining why the aircraft um, on the downwind usually are descending to 2000 feet. That's uh, because of traffic generally on the south runway. Um, so we have to separate the airplanes by 1,000 feet or three miles until they're established on the finals. So by going to two, it, uh, it ensures that that aircraft on the south runway by being at 3,000 feet or above um, actually also gets a stable approach. Now, there is an RMP for Fort Lauderdale from the northeast. Uh, however, it, it can't be used all the time uh, due to either traffic on the south runway or even traffic on the north runway that uh, uh, is conflicting based on the sequence. Right, and Rick, and I know um, that Gary can, can help out on this one too. I know there we made a concerted effort to ensure that we were able to join the approach or the the arrival procedures, the STARS, with the approach procedures. I know that's not always always possible because of airspace and other, other conflicting issues, but Gary, do you remember, were we um, successful in this area at all? We were successful on the straight in approaches from the west, uh, landing east. We were, and we did work on the, the east arrivals also. Uh, so 
because of some restrictions, we uh, weren't able to do a, a, a lot of completion work, but that, that may be ongoing in the future. Okay, so off of the downwinds, not so much. I mean, we tried, we did the optimal arrivals down to the downwind termination point, but we didn't get the connectivity to approach procedures, except for one, sounds like one RM procedure. So we yeah, do it, have. Yeah, Jim, it, it is really important for both the FAA and industry to make every attempt to, to build a procedure. And the way we try to do that is we try to build a start idle again. So the aircraft will help us do that. And then we try to join the approach to it that can also be at idle. The, but Ricky is correct. There's, we can't fly that off the downwind all the time. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible because they're sequencing a lot of traffic and they're trying to fit us into a hole. So we, we try to design them like that to be able to make every attempt to keep the airplane at idle. And on the straight ends, we also try to do the same thing. Uh, sometimes we need to do a better job, but we do make every attempt to do that. All right, Gary. Uh, and if, if I might add, Michael, uh, when there isn't conflicting traffic, we do try to stay at or above 3,000 feet with that uh, downwind traffic, um, being cognizant of uh, the surrounding communities there with Weston and Southwest ranches. All right, Rick, thank you. So again, when you look at the board, you have traffic heading west that has to turn back toward the airport. And that, that's gonna happen very similar to how it happens today. I think we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about Weston and Southwest ranches that we're mindful of the, the noise concerns there and look for, looking for opportunities when the south runway traffic allows to keep that north runway traffic higher. And we're working to build kind of the infrastructure for the future of the national airspace system. So hopefully, I think somebody touched on the fact that there's always the potential we build on this moving forward. But um, but the plan is that it'll be flown similar to how it is today, at least in the near term, as proposed with this project. Okay, we have another question for those of us living in the Pine Island Forest Ridge community. What would change under the proposed procedures? I may need a little help with that one. <laughs> if, if somebody can probably pull up uh, Google Earth, I'm not very familiar with that location of that community. That, that's approximately a five mile fine along the uh, for 10 left. So, I mean, I guess the short answer that I can see is not much. Yeah, that's the location that's really not going to be much change here. Correct, Cecil. All right. Yeah, if they're five miles out on final, right. Okay, thank you. It seems like a tremendous amount of work went into planning this project. How long have you been working on this redesign? Uh, Jim, <laughs> maybe you can tell us that. This is right up my alley. <laughs> This project started in uh, 2012 with a, a study team analysis of the uh, potential change or needed changes in the area, but it was a completely different project at that point in time. This was uh, you know, a much larger project. It was the equivalent of three metroplexes at that point in time. There were 52 airports included in it, and I think we mentioned there are 21 total at this point. Uh, it included um, approach procedures, changes in arrival and departure procedures, you know, a, a huge amount of work. I think I totaled up over 200 procedures at, at one point in time because that's my job. I keep track of those kinds of things. Um, and, and ultimately, we realized that that magnitude of change could um, drive us towards an environmental impact statement. We would be creating significant impacts. So subsequently, and this goes into the 16, 17 time frame. we started to de-scope the project. So we, we removed a large number of airports. We went from 52 down to the 21. And then subsequent to that, we uh, further de-scoped it to uh, reduce the impacts of the, the project itself by trying to limit as much as possible the changes that we made below 10,000 feet. And the exceptions to that 
you know, our safety related exceptions, like we just talked about with Gary, where we know we need to connect uh, safely between the arrival procedure and the approach procedure. So it's taken a long time. We started in 2012 and we have done a tremendous amount of work to right size it and to do the right thing for the communities. All right, thanks, Jim. All right, we have a question. Uh, can you please explain vertical and horizontal separation of aircraft arriving from the west at Fort Lauderdale? That maybe you want a couple of folks chime in on. Uh, so uh, air traffic, um, or the general uh, separation rule is three miles or 1,000 feet. Um, when it comes to arriving aircraft, uh, there are times where we have to increase the mileage, and that's usually when one aircraft is following uh, uh, another aircraft that's larger in size because that aircraft produces uh, weight turbulence. Now, when it comes to using both finals, there are times where we can have basically a side-by-side -side operation to both arrivals, for both arrivals, but one aircraft has to be um, on a visual approach as well as established on uh, a heading no more than 30 degrees to intercept the final. Um, we also use 1,000 feet until they're established on the final. And then thereafter, we can reduce the separation to the runway down to a mile and a half. Uh, Caesar, do you have anything to add in reference separation? No, I mean, obviously, I think you explained, you explained it well. Um... Uh, in an IMC world, in a, it, when we cannot see each other, when we're in the clouds and we cannot see the other aircraft, then we're relying entirely on you, on ATC, to make sure that, that we keep the airplanes safely separated um, from the adjacent final. Uh, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm on 10 right from, um, you know, perhaps Gary on 10 left. Um, so make sure we have, you know, we're, we're safely there. If, if the weather is fine and we can look out the window, then, you know, that's when you can come in side by side because obviously I, we can see each other at that point and, and we're not going to run into each other. I guess um, wake turbulence aside, what we're looking really for is time on the runway, time to be able to get on the runway, clear the runway so that the aircraft behind us uh, can safely land also. So, um, yeah, there's a, a difference obviously between visual and, and, uh, and instrument rules, but uh, I think, yeah, that's, I don't know, maybe Gary or somebody else wants to jump right in. I may have missed something out. It's, it's, it's a big question. It's a good question. I, I think you, both of you guys have done an excellent job of explaining what we as pilots and what the controllers do as a team to maintain the highest level of safety. We're separating aircraft and we're flying aircraft together, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Safety is the key, and if we don't do that job, we don't follow the instructions of the controller. We don't fly the airplane precisely. Uh, our, some of our safety equipment on board the airplane will start talking to us and tell us that we're doing something wrong also. But it's all about safety. The rules that we have in place help us fly airplanes daily in a very safe system. Yeah, great point, everybody. Uh, and absolutely, if there's a separation standard, it's driven by safety. So it's, it's to keep that the flying public safe. All right, thanks everyone. All right, we have another, it's a short question. Why can't the downwind be extended further west? I guess that's probably in the same area, uh, those east arrivals. Why can't the downwind be extended further west? Hey, hey Michael, um, for the most part, the, even though the procedure ends, it actually ends with a track. So the downwind doesn't it doesn't really move. It's it's almost it's indefinite. The the traffic mm -hmm. will continue west. Um, it also isn't going to influence where we're going to turn the base uh, the base turn for the aircraft because that's all based on uh, volume sequencing. There there are times where we have to turn base 20 25 miles west of Fort Lauderdale, and then there's times where we're turning base you know 10 to 15 miles west of Fort Lauderdale. So hey, and we Michael and um, Ricky, if I I can. Uh, Weigh in on this one too. Typically, we get that question when people uh, want us to raise the downwind altitude. So, why don't you raise the downwind altitude and extend the track further downwind? And what that does for the people who are underneath that extended track downwind is they get a two for one. 
as we fly over them on the way out when we're downwind and then when we turn around and we're coming back in we're flying by those same people again so that's generally speaking something that we would avoid uh, it, certainly it's not operationally feasible for for air traffic to, to do that and to maintain uh, the throughput at the airport okay let me just take 30 seconds if we could pull up that east flow i just i'm not going to say anything new i just want to make sure everybody understands so we looked at that last east flow chart and if you could just point where that the wayner fix is you can see all the the aircraft that are flying west of the aircraft airport uh, north of the airport flying west they turn basically and and correct me if i say anything wrong here rick or luis but um you're going to turn aircraft on you're going to make that turn that sort of sideways u and then get the aircraft flying back east to the runway based on when you have a gap in the in the traffic. So if there's no traffic coming from the west, you're gonna make that turn earlier. If you have several aircraft lined up coming from the west, you may have to make that turn later. And that's why you see what we call a splay of tracks where that occurs. Uh, so I think the question is why can't that just go further? And to Jim's point, uh, we, we turn them on back so that we can efficiently move that traffic with safe separation and we're going to do that when the traffic allows and we'll we'll keep them as high as we can based on what's going on with the south runway so hopefully that helps okay there's a question elso allows for simultaneous operations can you explain how simultaneous arrivals will be addressed for both runways not sure if we were close to that a minute ago or not <laughs> Yeah, that, that is a really good question. And uh, we probably touched on almost all aspects of that with the ATC, what they have to do for their standards and what we can do as a pilot. And it's dependent on if we're in IFR conditions in the clouds, whether we can see each other or we're in visual conditions where we can see the other adjoining aircraft. Those rules differ and uh, we, we have to abide by the rules that the FA publishes and the controllers help us maintain those. Okay. Right, and, and we need to clarify that ELSO is applied for departure procedures, designing departure procedures. And um, I think that uh, Rick and Luis have done a pretty good job explaining the requirements for doing the, the arrival operation here on the parallel runways at Fort Lauderdale, right. unless they have something else they would like to add to that. I don't have anything to add. All right. Okay. Uh, maybe a maybe more of a comment. Uh, sounds like this is all not relevant to light GA as we don't have PBN capability to fly radius to a fix. Um, so I may, Gary, I don't know if you want to say anything on that. I can. I'm part of a, an FAA industry group that actually is working on this. A radius to fix is an RAF flag that is currently only in RNPAR approaches. Uh, I can tell the, uh, the question, uh, the author of this question, that the a group of FAA and industry people are actually working on allowing a lot more aircraft to fly radius to fix legs. So in the next five years, I would say just set back. You'll probably be able to do those soon. And depending on the equipment you have in the airplane, you'll be able to see the benefit of those type of legs. All right, more to come. Thanks, Gary. Okay, here's one. On the ILS glide slope, aircraft should be at an altitude of 1,800 feet at the marker. So why would aircraft be dropped to 1,500 feet over Weston? Michael, I'll take that one. Um... As Ricardo mentioned before, we, we as traffic controllers, we try to be good neighbors and we try to avoid the situation as much as possible. However, there's uh, weather conditions such as low ceilings, reduced visibility. Sometimes the controllers are forced to descend the aircraft to 1,500 feet in order to get a visual approach and be able to maintain legal separation with the traffic on the parallel runway. Thanks, Luis. A lot of, a lot of complexity. So we've talked, Rick, did you have something? Yeah, I was going to say sometimes uh, the cloud coverage is, mm -hmm. um, you know, below 1800 feet. So if we need to get the visual approach, there are times where we have to descend even below the glide slope in order to accomplish that. 
Okay, thank you both. All right, during departures on runway 28 right, as soon as the planes have lifted off the runway, they start the 290 turn well before the end of the runway. This causes them to fly north of 595 over residential neighborhoods. Will this RNAV system prevent this so that the planes don't start turning until they have passed the end of the runway? Maybe, maybe a couple of you wanna chime in on this. Um, sure, I, I can take this. If we also want to pull up the West Departure Board, uh, the short answer is yes. The RNAV is is going to um, prevent the airplane from turning to a two nine zero heading, uh, depending on where they elevate off the runway. Uh, so initially, the departures are actually going to fly out to the west. I believe about a mile, maybe a little bit over a mile, before they start that turn to Dreads. And that should keep them south of 595 and the communities that uh, exist north of that highway. Okay. That, that would be correct. And uh, these procedures, again, using the flight management computer will do a lot better job of keeping the airplane where Ricky described. So that there will be some benefits to the new procedure in that area. Pardon me, Rick, if I didn't hear you say it, I know sometimes we use the caveat, but if there's a big thunderstorm west of the airport, you know, it doesn't mean that, the, that we won't have to turn airplanes at times, but when aircraft are routinely using this, everything you said would be the case, so, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, okay. When there's weather, I mean, there are times where we actually depart off Fort Lauderdale on a 340 heading, just whatever heading vector we need right. to make sure that the airplane avoids the, uh, the precipitation. Okay, I just want to make sure people don't hear never. Um, and so, I, right. All right, so we have a question. How high are the Fort Lauderdale left and right downwinds for the east and west runways? Um, I, for east flow, I guess let's start with east flow. I believe Wayne R ends at 5,000 feet. I'm not sure if we want to pull up the board. And then just want to 5,000 feet. And we'll keep them at 5,000 feet if they're going to continue westbound. Um, on a west flow descending out over the ocean, the altitude's probably either four or 5,000 feet. I'm not sure if you guys have a West arrive is that a West procedure? Um, it's very small on my uh, on my computer. So it looks like it ends actually at six thousand feet, pretty much uh, there over the ocean, and then the controller will descend based on traffic after that. Okay, Rick. Thanks. All right. Here's another one. Yesterday, someone asked if any of you have ever. I'm sorry, yesterday someone asked if any of you have ever come and heard the noise we have firsthand. You mentioned plantation, but have any of you actually come to the Lauderdale Isles neighborhood and heard the noise here for yourselves? So I figured someone would jump in before me. <laughs> Michael, I, I've, I've never gone out to Fort Lauderdale Isles for, for that purpose. Um, I, I, I can imagine, I believe Fort Lauderdale Isles is just west of the airport or west northwest of the airport. Right, and north of 595. So it's that area that we've been talking about. That's that dread, that area that's to the, uh, a little bit to the north and uh, east. Exactly. That's, that's Lauderdale Isles. So right, I guess if we looked at the board again, you know that that if we looked at the uh, west departure board again, kind of the close in view. There you go. In Lauderdale, Lauderdale Isles is uh, I'm going to say right there. Yeah, if we can blow it in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there. Yeah, so it would be right in that area, I guess around Melwood, uh, Riverdale. I'm gonna try, I need to leave it to you guys who work the the airspace there where, uh, you know, to the north and to the east of Dreads. But- uh, 
Well, I mean, Jim, I guess what I would say is, I mean, I, I live here in Atlanta, so I, I'm familiar with, I think we can all imagine similar places. I've lived in, in, in areas that are not Lauderdale Isles, but I think the fact that, and I believe the folks that we've worked with would testify to this, but we we're aware of Lauderdale Isles. I think a lot of the conversation tonight has shown a recognition of the team in terms of how it was designed. I don't know that we necessarily need to sit overnight, so to speak, in a particular neighborhood to know that there have been comments from a community and work to try to address those. And I, I hope what that community hears is that we're working to keep the procedure designed such that traffic will stay south of 595, and that's in recognition of that. I don't know if anybody has anything more specific to add on it, but that's, that's about as detailed as I could be. Uh, yes, Michael. Actually, the way the RNAV uh, procedure is built that uses the waypoint dreads, um, the aircraft is initially going to depart due westbound, so it should stay south of that area. Um, I believe it's going to fly for about a mile, maybe a mile and a half before it starts to turn to dreads. So I do believe that this procedure um, could benefit uh, that Fort Lauderdale Isles uh, location. Right. And that, that's a tough tough place to be. Uh, any, anytime you're within 10 miles of one of these airports, or, you know, we are tied to the, uh, the runways themselves. So the arrivals and the departures, they're to a fixed location. When we're trying to turn airplanes off a runway, then for these projects, I know we keep saying that we make, um, we have no significant change. In some areas, you're going to see a, a positive impact. Their noise will be less than it was previously. I don't know if they'll notice that. We know that people are very perceptive and they, they will see that airplanes have moved from one position to another. We think in this one, just like um, Rick said that, um, well, we think that we're gonna be a little bit further south on that, on that turn. And I think that that's the case too, because what we're looking at here with these radar tracks on these boards is the existing right. condition. And where we want to be is the uh, future condition where you go to dreads on a course to that point and we're pretty certain that that's going to drive airplanes a little bit further south so and concur with michael we all know uh what it's like to be impacted by noise you know i've you know set my high airplanes with their wheels down fly over my house so it's uh we we all live in the area in fact i think ricky you live out in the western area if i'm not mistaken all of the people uh, who have been a part of this project locally uh, know the area, they, they live in the areas, and they are very familiar with the impacts. Okay, thanks, Jim. So I'm not really doing a time check, but we have four more questions we're going to try to push through here. So uh, the first one is, how long will the archives videos of these workshops be available? And I'll, I'll say that we're going to we're going to transfer these to the FAA website. They'll stay up at least until the implementation late in 2021. Uh, you know, I'm, some of these are streaming on YouTube, so in my mind they're out there forever, but uh, on the FAA website you should be able to find us at least until the project if we get to an implementation date that would be in 2021 and you could expect these to be available until that time. All right, we have a, another one. If I understand correctly, that prior to 2012, the coordinated heading for jet departures off FLL on a West operation was a 275 heading. I think I read that the way it was written, but anyway. Uh, is this what current environmental studies base their models on? Between 2012 and the opening of the redesigned South Runway, the letter of agreement heading was moved north to 285 and today, the letter of agreement assigned heading is 290. I believe this would explain the increase in noise complaints to Broward County from homeowners who live north of 595. Uh, any comments on that? I, I don't see us. I guess there's a question about the environmental studies, but that's going to be based on historic tracks, right, Lisa? That's right, Michael. And um, yeah, that's based on historic tracks. So I don't, I can't speak to the, the letter of agreement. Any clarification from air traffic? Luis, did you have something kind of walking through the different headings? Um, 
So what he's referring, it's really not related to, to this project. It's probably related to the extension of the South Broadway and how they, you know, they, they started parallel operation, parallel uh, dependent departures at the same time from parallel runways. Um, the rest, we can, it's basically what we just talked about with the fixed uh, dreads, right. the procedures starting up off the ground, how they're going to go basically straight away for about a mile and a half before they intercept the track that takes them to dreads and should keep them south of 595 and uh, the community that we discussed before in the previous question. Do we have that? Do we have that heading? I know we showed that turn. Is that relevant? I'm not trying to stump the panel. So, uh, I mean, it looks like they're going basically due west and then they make a turn, but um, those are those are points that are available on some of the procedures that we've shown. And I'm not quite sure where to go with that. So the environmental studies would be based on the, a comparison of what's projected in the project, looking back at what aircraft were flying between 2017 and 2018, the middle of those years. So I, I think that's what the question is, is that what current environmental studies base their models on? And it would be what aircraft actually flew in 2017 into 2018. Okay, why can't the planes fly further to the east when they take off before they turn? Wouldn't that be quieter? Michael, can, let me try to uh, help with that just a little bit. Let me, let me first talk about today. When we take off going east, we're issued a heading that we turn to. And we do that at 400 feet. So we take off, we climb to 400 feet, and we immediately turn to the heading that we're assigned. Tomorrow, with the new procedures, that's not going to happen. So the heading that we're flying today, we turn left, or, or the heading that we're assigned, about 15 to 16 degrees. Tomorrow, with the new procedures, we will go further straight ahead because we're not allowed to turn at, at, until 500 feet, which goes further out over the water, and we're only turning 11 degrees. So that they will go further out before we make those turns by the design of the procedures. That was the, the careful thought that was given into these to try to make that exact thing happen. All right, Gary, thank you for that. Rick, anything to add? Yeah, I, I can add on to that as well. Uh, when we design these procedures, um, we use current track data and we try to mirror current track data as you can see, this procedure that turns out to the north is pretty much in the middle of that, that backbone. Also, if we were to drive these departures farther east, we would actually um, restrict the aircraft at probably at 5,000 feet for a longer period of time, as opposed to trying to climb them to the top of our airspace, airspace which is 16,000 feet. Uh, um, for the departure controllers to get this aircraft climbing as fast as we can. And if we have to go farther to the east, it's going to happen more often that we're going to actually have to stop that aircraft at 5,000 feet as opposed to being able to get them all the way up to our airspace. All right. Thanks for adding on. And thanks again, Gary. Um, all right. So I think this is our final question. For west departures using two runways, why can't you use staggering and eliminate the 15 degree turn? Hey, Lewis, do you want to take this one? I'm a radar approach controller. I've never actually worked in the tower. I think this affects the tower operation to a certain extent. Uh, Lewis has worked up in the tower, so maybe he can explain better. Um. Yeah, when, so when you have two runways, the, the idea is to use them as safely and as efficiently as possible. So if you were to stagger, the, there will be a, large, a longer amount of time before you can release the, the next departure affecting the efficiency mm -hmm. of the airport. Um, so eliminating the new dual RNAV pass will cost less cap, uh, capacity for the airport. Uh, thing to mention, also came a... Um, we mentioned also before 
it's going to be like, instead of the 15 degrees like the like in the question we're going to use see i believe it's 11 degrees in, in in this operation and we're still going to be able to accomplish keeping the departures uh, south of 595 as long as possible on the west operation okay caesar or something there yeah just wanted to stress uh just a so that we don't lose the fact that when these procedures are in effect, that 80 heading is gonna go away, that uh, unless of course there's uh, thunderstorms in the area or we, something out of the ordinary, but when we're actually flying in these procedures, we're flying them off the runway. So that 290 heading that's getting close to Lauderdale Isles, we won't be on that 290 heading anymore. Uh, that 80 heading that gets close to, um, you know, the north side of Port Everglades, we won't be on that 80 heading anymore will be on this RNAV procedure off the runway. Yeah, there's a little bit of um, flexibility there right after takeoff, but um, soon after that, you're basically on that runway heading until the aircraft intercepts, understands that it's got to start making that turn to follow the path, and we will be on that path. So, uh, and, and I think I, that's something we cannot forget, that, that will alleviate a lot of the other uh, questions and, uh, that have been coming in from the community. Caesar, thanks for adding on there. All right, I'm looking at the panel. I think that brings us to a close. That brings us to the end of the workshop. So I wanna thank everybody for participating. Everybody who answered, uh, asked us a lot of uh, good questions tonight. I hope our answers were informative. Uh, you know, I wanna thank all of our, our specialists who provided expertise, our entire FA communications team, everybody else who supported this workshop in the background and acknowledge the industry representatives who joined us this evening to contribute their perspectives to the discussion. So thank you for that. As a reminder, your questions today are not part of the legal record for the draft environmental assessment. To comment for the record, please go to the comments tab on this website, floridametroplexworkshops.com. You can also email us or send us a written comment and the addresses for those are on the comments tab on that same website. Again, the comment period is open until July 10th, 2020. After the comment period closes, the FAA will consider and review all substantive comments received during the comment period. The agency expects to issue an environmental de determination in September, 2020. This workshop is being recorded. It'll be available for playback on the website tomorrow, along with the recordings for the workshops that took place yesterday and the day before for Fort Lauderdale. So that concludes our workshop this evening, and I wanna thank you again for joining us.